So, yes, yeah, so uh, my group uh, has been working for uh, 20 years or more now, trying to understand the answer to the question, why do some people develop allergic disease and other people don't? Um, we know that it's a combination of both environmental and genetic factors that are important, and it's the interaction of those that will determine whether any one individual will develop an allergic disease and at what time in life they do that. Uh, so just for those who aren't uh, particularly aware, I'll just start with a very brief introduction of allergic disease. So allergic disease is focused around um, uh, sort of T helper 2 type inflammation, uh, generating an IgE antibodies. Uh, and when you uh, are sensitized to a uh, allergen uh, and you encounter that allergen again, you'll generate an immune response uh, which can cause symptoms in different organs depending on the type of allergy you have. So it's not just whether you're allergic or not, it's if you are allergic, whether you will develop clinical symptoms and what symptoms you will develop. And so when we think about the genetics, there are going to be some commonalities between all allergic conditions, which are about the type of immune, system, immune response you make, uh, how sensitive you are to triggers, um, a strength of inflammatory response you make, and there are going to be some differences because there are 40% of us more will be sensitive to an allergen. So if we, uh, if we do a skin prick test, put bits of allergen on the skin and, and pierce the skin with a, uh, uh, a needle, uh, about 40% of us will react to a common allergen. You know, it could be pollen or a house dust mite or a food allergen, but only 20 or 15% of us will uh, have respiratory uh, allergy uh, or slightly more uh, will have nasal allergy, rhinitis or hay fever um, or uh, skin allergy, so atopic dermatitis or more rare food allergy, so allergic reactions uh, in the GI tract uh, and very rarely uh, systemic allergy, so anaphylaxis, sort of severe allergic response, uh, multi-system that can be life-threatening. So when we think about the genetics, we need to think about the genetics of allergen sensitization, but also the genetics of what we uh, sometimes term the end organ. So if I'm allergic, why do I develop asthma or atopic dermatitis, or why am I just sensitized and don't develop uh, clinical symptoms? So. As I said, my PhD was on the genetics of asthma, trying to understand why some people develop asthma. And that got me thinking about the question, when is the point in life at which someone begins to develop an allergic disease? Uh, is it when they first encounter an allergen or other things that are already established before that point that mean when they encounter the allergen, they'll develop that uh, sensitization and then on subsequent re-exposure, develop allergic symptoms. And if you sit down and think about it, at birth or shortly after birth, you can look at physiological parameters and the different organs that are affected by allergic disease, and you can already see differences in infants who are subsequently going on to develop allergic disease compared to those who don't. So you can look in the skin and you can see that uh, infants who go on to develop atopic dermatitis will have a different uh, rate of trans water loss. So there's a difference in the skin barrier. You can look uh, at lung function in infants and you will see differences in lung function in infants who subsequently go on to develop asthma compared to those who don't. And you can take immune cells, so from cord blood, uh, you can stimulate them and you can look at the effect of molecules that are generated, the cytokine profile, uh, proliferation and things. Uh, and you, again, people have shown differences at birth in immune responses in infants who subsequently go on to develop allergic disease compared to those who don't. So at this point, we have genetic influences and we can have environmental influences. So the environment before you're born, the maternal environment uh, while uh, the individual was developing in utero, have already influenced the allergic disease trajectory by the time of birth. So that takes the when question back in time, not age five, perhaps when you first develop uh, asthma symptoms, but it takes it back to uh, before birth. So 
what could be influencing uh, developmental trajectories that lead you to the susceptibility at birth, these differences at birth. So part of it can be genetic because we have our genetics from the moment of conception. And part of it could be epigenetic because epigenetic factors respond to the environment and we know that the environment in that uh, period of development in utero can influence risk of uh, allergic disease subsequently. So I'm not going to talk too much about the genetics of allergic disease today. Um, this is a, a nice summary of several decades of studies from around the world doing genome-wide association studies, uh, trying to find genetic variants that predispose towards allergic disease. And you can see we have a whole range of different uh, genes, uh, different levels of significance uh, that have been identified using this genome-wide association approach. So we know that genetics are important, but we know it's not the only thing. So you can be genetically susceptible to asthma, but you will not develop asthma uh, if you don't encounter the right environment at the right point in your life. So as I said, the environment's important, and we know that multiple different environmental risk factors have been associated with risk of developing uh, allergic diseases. Uh, so they include things like indoor and outdoor air pollution, uh, diet, infection, allergen exposure, uh, exposure to medications. It goes on and on. There's a whole list of different environmental factors that have been shown to predispose people towards uh, different uh, allergic disease. And of course, these factors interact. So the, it isn't a sort of additive uh, process. I have a defined genetic risk and a defined environment risk. And if I add the two together, am I over a threshold of develop disease? Getting these uh, synergistic interactions between the two. Uh, and this is just one example, um, a paper that was published uh, almost 15 years ago now, looking at a particular genetic variant uh, that had been shown to be associated with risk of asthma. It's a variant in a gene called CD14, which is a component of the innate immune response. Uh, CD14 senses uh, a molecule called uh, endotoxin. It's present in the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. And we know that endotoxin exposures uh, were associated with uh, protection from allergic disease. And so you can see here we've got our three genotype groups for the CD14 gene. And at low endotoxin levels in the home, you can see that this uh, CC genotype uh, is the risk genotype uh, for allergic sensitization. But at high endotoxin levels in the home, you're actually getting a reversal of the effect. And here the CC genotype is protect, uh, protective uh, and it's a, a T allele that seems to be uh, a risk allele. So you're getting these uh, complex interactions between environmental exposure and genetic background determining an individual's risk. So you need to consider all of them together. You can't just look at one alone. And we know that's true because uh, you know, we've spent many years, lots of money, hundreds of thousands of people identifying genetic variants in genome-wide association studies that predispose towards allergic disease. But if we try and use genetics alone to predict who will develop allergic disease, the predictions aren't particularly good. So we need to combine with environmental exposures and other things to be able to assess an individual's risk. But what about uh, epigenetics? It was in the title of the talk, so uh, I had to get to it at some point. Where does epigenetics come uh, in this picture? So just a brief introduction, what we mean by epigenetics. So epigenetics are these processes uh, above the genome, so molecular changes within cells that alter the regulation transcription but don't alter the sequence of the DNA in the genome. So they're robust, but also uh, flexible to change. So by that, I mean that they're stable through mitosis. So you can take a cell as a particular epigenetic profile, that cell will divide and it will retain that epigenetic profile. Okay. So epigenetic profiles are telling a cell what it is. It's telling an airway epithelial cell, it's an airway epithelial cell, and when it divides, it's still an airway epithelial cell. And we know that's true because we can take an adult differentiator cell, a fibroblast, for example, we can transfect the MLR factors in there, and we can wipe this epigenetic program, and we have an induced pluripotent stem cell that can become any type of cell 
with the right environmental stimulus, the right cofactors, uh, growth factors, et cetera, in the medium, because the environment will change the epigenetic profile and lead to cellular differentiation. So they allow us to change gene expression in response to environment. As I said, they're stable through mitosis. And towards the end of the talk, I'll give you some evidence to suggest that some of these epigenetic factors can be stable through meiosis as well, and that maybe we can get transmission of epigenetic uh, memory uh, between generations. Uh, it's sort of a catch-all term, lots of different uh, cellular mechanisms that sort of lumped into the epigenetic bucket. Um, but really what we're talking about is a combination of different things, whether that's post-translational modification of histones, uh, DNA methylation, that ultimately affect remodeling of the chromatin, accessibility of the chromatin to transcription factors, and therefore regulating uh, transcription. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking uh, in, sorry, uh, mainly about uh, DNA methylation, adding methyl groups to CPGs, the dinucleotides, so adding a, a methyl group to the cysteine, followed by guanine in the genome. And the reason that I'll concentrate on that mainly is because in human epidemiological studies, uh, we can measure DNA methylation and DNA samples uh, relatively easily. And all the DNA samples we've collected over many years for genetic studies of disease, we can also measure methylation in those same DNA samples. Whereas most of us who have these large human cohorts, uh, we spent a lot of time and money collecting, uh, didn't process uh, the, the uh, DNA at the time in a way that we could measure um, uh, other things like uh, histone changes uh, in the samples that we have. Um, so that's not to say they're not important. Um, they are because really it's the complex of chromatin remodeling that ultimately is the consequence of both histone and methylation changes. But I'll talk about methylation now as a sort of uh, relatively easy output to measure in large scale human studies. <clears throat> And as I said, epigenetic mechanisms regulate cellular differentiation. They tell a cell what it is, and we can, from a uh, differentiated cell, we can create an epi uh, induced pluripotent stem cell by wiping the epigenetic memory of that cell. So if we think uh, environment is important in susceptibility to allergic disease and genetics are important, where does epigenetics come in? So if we think epigenetics can change in response to environment, uh, is there any evidence that environmental exposures that are risk factors for allergic disease uh, modify the epigenome in individuals? So we can test that out. We can take human studies where we extract DNA from individuals, we look at their environmental exposure, and we say, can we see differences in the methylome based on the environmental exposure? And in the literature, there is a whole range of different environmental exposures, whether that's maternal uh, nutrition during pregnancy, uh, growing up on a farm, which is a protective factor for allergic disease, particularly farms with animals. Um, so definitely small children need to play with animals out on the farm. Um, uh, air pollution, another example, uh, season of birth is another risk factor for uh, allergic disease, uh, and these have all been associated with differences in DNA methylation in individuals. So we can see a relationship between the environment and the methylation, but is that relevant to uh, development of disease? We do these types of studies, uh, epigenome-wide association studies, uh, by uh, using uh, commonly uh, arrays, high-density arrays, um, the latest generation survey about uh, 850,000 CPG sites across the genome where we can measure the methylation quantitatively uh, between 0 and 1 or 0 percent and 100 percent at, at specific uh, uh, CPG sites across the genome. And the things we've learned from doing these type of studies is that when you look at an environmental exposure and the methylome, you see specific changes in the methylome in response to specific environmental exposures. So whatever the process that leads from environmental exposure to a change in epigenome, it is specific to the exposure. So different exposures will give you a different signature. So this is one example. Um, 
uh, a meta-analysis from the Pregnancy and Childhood Epigenetics Consortium, uh, led by uh, Professor Stephanie London, uh, we contributed some of the data to this meta-analysis. So this is looking at uh, the association, so is the level of significance with CPGs across the genome, and here they are positioned by chromosome, uh, for the level of methylation being associated with uh, whether the mother smoked during pregnancy or not. And so we're taking DNA of the child at birth, so cord blood DNA, we're measuring the methylation of the child, and we're saying, is the methylation at specific CPG sites associated with the mother's environmental exposure uh, during pregnancy? And you see very strong association at specific CPG sites that are consistent across cohorts from different parts of the world and different environmental backgrounds. So the smoking exposure is giving you a specific signature that's consistent despite the variability of other factors in uh, the different groups that contribute data to the study. It's always nice when you get p-values of 10 to the minus 100 and whatever makes you believe that the association is uh, true. And we learned from studies like this and now subsequently many other studies looking at uh, in utero ex environmental exposures uh, and methylation profiles of infants and children that a specific environmental exposure will give you a specific uh, epigenetic signature. We also could see that these effects persist. So if you look in older children, uh, in this case, uh, five of the cohorts that are involved in the analysis had uh, DNA samples collected later in childhood, uh, that you could see the same signature. So the effect persisted. It wasn't an effect you could measure at birth, shortly after the environmental exposure of mother smoking during pregnancy. Later in childhood, you could still see the same epigenetic signature. And in fact, uh, we've gone on uh, with my Yurita Yalvalin and the Northern Finnish birth cohort, and others have done this as well now, to look in adults and look at the DNA methylation in blood from adults compared to whether their mother smoked when they were pregnant with them. And we see the same DNA signature that we see in the children and in the cord blood. So that epigenetic memory, if you like, of that exposure during pregnancy has persisted through to uh, the fourth or fifth decade of life. So is it just a biomarker of exposure or does it actually mean in something in terms of susceptibility to disease? We know that genetic factors can also change the epigenome. So you can look for association between genetic variants and epigenetic changes. Uh, so we often turn these, if we're looking at methylation, uh, methylation quantitative trait loci. So this is where methylation at a specific base pair, specific CPG site varies depending on the sequence at an adjacent or uh, sometimes uh, far distant uh, signal nucleoside polymorphism. Uh, so this paper that was uh, published about two years ago and it led by uh, Josie Min, again, combined data from lots of different cohorts, uh, including ours, where DNA methylation data was available and also genome-wide association data or genome-wide genotyping was available. And what they did was to build a catalog of these MethQTLs uh, to identify um, uh, over 270,000 CPG sites where the methylation was associated with genotype. So then the question is, well, is that how a genetic variant might lead to disease? Could it be through altering epigenetic profiles which regulate gene expression, which then change phenotype? And so you can, do, you can ask the questions, is it just that you've got a SNP that predisposes towards disease and you've got a methylation site that predisposes towards disease and they happen to be close to each other? Or are they actually on the causal pathway? Is it the SNP affects the methylation, the methylation affects the disease? And you can use a statistical approach uh, of Mendelian randomization to try and assess whether these are causal or not. In fact, the answer is that yes, while genetics affects methylation at lots of different sites, for most diseases, it, does, it seems to be independent effects. It's not that the genetic effect associated with disease is working through changing the DNA methylation. Um, it's probably not universal though. So you, in this case, they look for enrichment of particular disease-associated genetic variants in this uh, catalog. Uh, 
uh, and for allergic disease, allergic dermatitis, atopic dermatitis or eczema, uh, SNPs were enriched uh, in these MetQTLs, but uh, not asthma. But at specific sites, so 17 q 2 d one is the strongest genetic effect for susceptibility to asthma. And here you see co-localization, so at the same genetic uh, location of uh, SNPs that affect disease and SNPs that affect um, methylation at that locus as well. And of course, looking within a single gene, you can begin to see these interaction effects as well. So this was a paper we published uh, almost 10 years ago now, where we looked at a specific gene, in this case, the interleukin-4 receptor, so part of the immune uh, uh, system. And we're looking at uh, three different genotype groups across a range of methylation levels in our cohort. So we can measure methylation at CPG sites in the gene, we can measure the genotype, and we can say, what's the risk of developing uh, allergic disease? And we can see that at low levels of methylation, we're seeing no difference between genetic groups. And at higher levels of methylation at the CPG site, we begin to see the differences uh, in risk by genotype. So you're getting these interactions between the epigenetic profile within a gene and the genetic profile uh, in the genome of the individual determining the risk of developing disease in an individual. So genetics can affect methylation, environment can affect methylation. Those effects are specific and they're stable throughout life. Are they associated with uh, risk of disease? So again, I'm showing you data from another uh, PACE cohort analysis. This is looking at DNA methylation at birth in children and saying, is methylation at specific CPG sites associated with later development of asthma in those children? Uh, and the answer is uh, yes. So you can see uh, significant, not a huge number, but a number of CPG sites where the methylation at birth is associated with later risk of developing. Uh, in this case, it was a phenotype called wheeze, which is sort of uh, bronchial symptoms, which is related to asthma. It's not quite the same as clinical asthma, but it's what is often measured in cohorts uh, before we can get a clinical diagnosis. <laughs> but uh, other studies in single cohorts have also shown association between methylation early in life and later development of uh, allergic disease. Uh, this is one such study uh, that we did in our Isle of Wight cohort. Uh, in this case, we're looking at DNA methylation at birth. Uh, we didn't have cord blood in this cohort, but we did have uh, Guthrie cards, so blood spots and filter paper that were collected uh, when these children were born uh, over 30 years ago. We could extract DNA from those uh, blood spots uh, and measure the methylone in the same way as we get from uh, uh, blood DNA. And uh, we could then relate that methylation, which was taken you know, a week after birth, to, uh, in this case, lung function trajectories measured throughout childhood up to uh, age 26. Uh, and again, we could show that methylation at birth was associated whether you had a, a, a low lung function growth trajectory or a high lung function growth tra uh, trajectory uh, that in itself is then related to risk of developing asthma. So epigenetics, influenced by genetics, influenced by environment, stable throughout life and associated with uh, risk of disease. But again, the question is, uh, is it cause or effect? So is the environment giving you an epigenetic signature? Is it the epigenetics that is then actually causing you to develop the disease? Or is it just a biomarker of the environmental exposure and the environmental exposure is causing disease through altering development in some way or altering growth in childhood uh, and uh, having a direct effect on uh, risk of disease. Well, we can begin to look at that. We can look at it in terms of timing. So again, if you do cross-sectional studies of, uh, say, case control of people with disease and without disease and look at um, epigenetic profiles, you'll see lots of differences between people with and without disease. Most of those differences will be because there are differences in tissue composition between your cases and your controls, particularly for immune-mediated disorders. If you're looking at blood-derived DNA, you will see a difference in DNA methylation profile in individuals depending on how many neutrophils they have, how many T-cells, what T-cell subsets are within the blood. So uh, 
In cohort studies, we can use timing. So we can say we measured methylation at this point in time when there were no clinical differences between individuals, and we can associate it with subsequent risk. Uh, but again, could it just be a biomarker of some environmental exposure that is driving disease and not on the causal pathway? But we can also use statistical approaches uh, uh, to um, so things like mediation analysis and uh, Mendelian randomization to try and show whether uh, the environmental exposure is associated with the outcome via DNA methylation or not. And this is just one example that we published a couple of years ago, uh, looking in this case. Uh, BMI trajectories through childhood between birth and 10, which we knew were associated with risk of developing asthma across adolescence. Uh, we measured methylation at 10. We could find association between the trajectories and the methylation, the methylation and the disease. And so at least in part, DNA methylation appeared to be an intermediate between this exposure and this outcome. So it may lie on the causal pathway rather than just being a biomarker of the exposure. So we believe that uh, epigenetics is an important integrator, if you like, of a range of different exposures, both genetic and environmental, uh, that can then lead to predisposition to disease years or decades later. Question is, when does that epigenetic profile start? How early is early life? So I've talked about exposures in pregnancy, but what about before pregnancy or before conception? So what do I mean by uh, inter and transgenerational effects? So if we take this uh, pregnant mother uh, and we expose her to the environment, uh, we're exposing her genome to the environment, potentially changing her epigenetic profile. We're exposing her unborn infant's genome to the environment, potentially changing its epigenome. And we've seen that, I've shown the example of maternal smoking and pregnancy and changes in DNA methylation in the offspring. But we're also exposing uh, the stem cells that will form the gametes of her grandchild, potentially directly to the environment as well. So if we see an exposure of this a woman and we see an increased risk of disease in the grandchild, that be, could be because of a direct effect of the environment on the genome of the grandchild because we're exposing these gametes to the environment. Uh, and we call that an intergenerational effect. If we saw an effect in the great-grandchildren, that would have to imply that the memory of that environmental exposure is being passed through meiosis because you're not getting a direct effect of the environmental exposure in this generation on this generation here. On the paternal line, we need to go through fewer generations. So exposing a male to environment exposes his own genome to the environment, particularly changing his epigenetic profile, but could also expose the germ cells that will uh, form the gametes that will contribute to his children's genome. Uh, but if we see an effect persisting to the grandchildren, uh, that implies that there must be a transgenerational effect. So this is in humans. It's quite hard to do these studies in humans. Uh, it takes a little while to go through four generations in humans, probably longer than most of our careers, definitely longer than mine. Uh, humans are quite difficult to study because they don't like to have a nice consistent environment throughout many decades. They don't tend to breed with who we want them to breed with, and they don't tend to have children on demand. Uh, but you can see these effects in experimental models which are much easier to do. You can run through four generations of mice in a, in a year or uh, even less than that if you're using a model like Drosophila or a zebrafish, for example. Uh, and you, of course, you can control the environment in every generation. Uh, so most of the evidence for these inter and transgenerational effects are coming from experimental models where people can control the environment, so they can control the exposure, the timing and dose of the exposure. Uh, they can control the environment across multiple generations and they can see the effect of environment in one generation and outcomes in subsequent generations. So is there evidence for inter and transgenerational effects in asthma and allergic disease? And if we go to animal models, we can say that yes, there's evidence of different exposures giving you effects in subsequent generations. And this is just one example. Uh, so this was, sorry, uh, this is, uh, uh, 
perinatal nicotine induced transgenerational uh, asthma. So this is giving uh, nicotine uh, in the drinking water to uh, gestating uh, rats, the F0 generation, and uh, the data I'm showing you from this paper that was uh, published uh, a few years ago now is looking at lung function and lung fibroblast cellular phenotype in the F3, so the uh, great-grandchildren uh, of uh, these uh, pregnant uh, rats. And you can see differences uh, in uh, lung function, uh, but also in um, lung fibroblast uh, phenotype in these sort of F3 generations when the exposure was only in the F0 generation. So you don't keep exposing in every generation, you get the exposure in one generation, you can see those effects persisting in subsequent generations. And as I said, there's been a whole range of other studies, um, uh, things like plasticizers, phthalates, uh, side stream uh, smoke exposures, uh, particular air pollutions, and so on, that have shown similar multi-generational effects in animal models. That's all well and good. You could argue about whether the exposure in the animals is the same as the exposure in humans, and you can argue whether your measure of asthma is the same in an animal model as it is in humans. And as other people would say that animals don't get asthma, that you're measuring other things. Uh, what about humans? Well, there, when we started working in this field, there were bits and pieces of evidence. Uh, this was one study that, uh, one of the first that came out that was looking at maternal and grand maternal uh, smoking patterns and early childhood asthma. So they knew that mother smoking in pregnancy was associated with increased risk of asthma in the child. But what about grandmother smoking in pregnancy? And you can see here in this group here, where the mother smoked in pregnancy with her child, but her child didn't smoke during pregnancy when pregnant with the grandchild, but the grandchild still had a significantly increased risk of asthma, suggesting that you're getting a, a memory of the effect through two generations. It's not three, so it's not transgenerational. It could still be a direct effect. Uh, but it suggested that these multi-generational effects uh, might be relevant uh, to allergic disease. Uh, and there've been a whole range of studies now, um, uh, particularly those that have been carried out by my uh, collaborator, uh, Cecily Sparnes and, and all the other uh, wonderful colleagues that are part of the Rhinessa Consortium, uh, where we're looking at these multi-generational uh, epidemiological cohorts uh, from uh, Scandinavia, Spain, and Australia. And we can see that uh, increased asthma risk in the grandchildren caused by grand maternal smoking, but also paternal smoking. So here we're not just seeing down the female line, but also through the male line, that if the father was exposed to an environmental factor before conceiving his children, you can see an increased risk of disease uh, in the children. So I said there's more and more studies of this now looking at uh, asthma, uh, lung function, and now beginning to look at other phenotypes as well. Uh, a range of exposures, so whether that's smoking, uh, uh, also being able to look at things like occupational exposures, such as cleaning products, uh, and uh, also things like uh, parental BMI uh, before conception of children. So whether obesity in one generation might have consequences on disease risk in subsequent generations. Uh, so th this is just an example of some of the studies coming from the uh, Rhinessa cohort. Um, here you can see uh, across the different study centers, but here's the overall effect. Uh, preconceptional smoking from the fathers and offspring risk of asthma. So offspring have a higher risk, so 1.5 fold increased risk of asthma uh, if the father started smoking before conceiving his children. And in this study and, and other studies and various sensitivity analyses, uh, we know that there's a particularly sensitive period and that sensitive period is in adolescence and adolescence is when men start making the, uh, the germ well differentiating the germ cells that will start producing gametes for the rest of his life and if you're exposed at that point so what we use in the epidemiological studies if they start smoking before the age of 15 we see the strongest effect on the subsequent generation uh, for women that's a different time point so that time since in window is probably occurring at a different point in development because the germ cells that will form a woman's child, the eggs, 
are actually formed when she is in utero and therefore exposing the grandmother during pregnancy is probably the sensitive window for affecting that grandchild. Uh, and uh, sorry, and uh, we've gone on to uh, use um, sort of more sophisticated statistical modeling. Uh, Simone Accadini from uh, the University of Verona has led all these analyses to try and separate out the different effects. Uh, and we can uh, see using this uh, multi-level modeling that's accounting for uh, the multiple mediators, the multiple outcomes, the clustering within families and so on, uh, that um, these uh, uh, fathers smoking uh, independently increases asthma risk uh, from other exposures such as uh, the parents or grandparents own asthma, because we also know that asthma activity in one generation is an increased risk of asthma in subsequent generations. Uh, and we also see effects of grandmother smoking and other effects uh, within the cohorts. So a lot of this uh, field, early origins of disease or developmental origins of disease is focused on maternal exposures in environment or the first 1,000 days of after birth and saying, well, that's a critical window in development that will determine lifelong health of that offspring. And what we would argue now is that actually you need to bring that window back. You need to think about before conception. Uh, you need to think about preconceptional health. And you need to think about preconceptional health of both mothers and fathers because exposures of the parents before conceiving the children can lead to increased risk of disease uh, in their children. So what are the mechanisms? What are the biological mechanisms that can account for this transfer of information between generations? So uh, these are some nice studies from a PhD study of a student of mine, uh, uh, Torrell, who uh, just graduated two weeks ago in, uh, at the University of Bergen. And what we set out to do uh, in, this, in her studies um, was to say, if father smoking before conception was associated with asthma risk in the children, is it via an epigenetic mechanism? So can we look at DNA methylation in the offspring and relate that to the father's exposure before conception. So can we find a signature of that prior exposure? Uh, so we looked at two groups. So we looked at those who had any smoke exposure before conception of the children and those who started smoking early, so before the age of 15, which we thought was this particular sensitive period where we see the strongest epidemiological effects. And in the offspring, we looked at DNA methylation uh, genome-wide. We also wanted to investigate whether those methylation signals, if we found any associated with father smoking in the offspring, were the same or were they different to the epigenetic signatures we see from personal smoking, so if someone smokes themselves, or from mother smoking during pregnancy. And then are those DNA methylation factors, if we found any, were they associated with risk of disease? Uh, and uh, this paper is um, still trying to be published. Some interesting sets of reviews that we're trying to respond to, but you can uh, read most of the data in bioarchive at the moment if you're interested. But essentially, the bottom line is that, yes, we can see a specific epigenetic signature in male and female offspring of fathers who smoke before conception. Uh, particularly those fathers who started smoking in adolescence, so before the age of 15. That epigenetic signature is different to the signature you see if the mother smokes during pregnancy, and it's different to the signature you see if someone smokes themselves. So it's a specific record, if you like, of that environmental exposure. The methylation at those CPG sites is associated with risk of disease in the offspring. Of course, what we can't tell is whether that it's on the causal pathway or whether it's just representing the biomarker of that father's exposure. But given that the exposure occurred before conception of the offspring, and yet we still see the signature and the signatures associated with disease, we would argue that perhaps it, that epigenetic profile is on the causal pathway uh, between exposure and outcome. So what does this mean? It means that we need to account for paternal exposures in our epidemiological studies. So father adolescence exposures may affect the epigenetic patterns and the phenotype in their offspring. Uh, 
So we've seen effects with smoking, but what are other relevant exposures? What are other things should we be thinking about in terms of the health of the population where we should be targeting uh, adolescents to try and improve their health in order to improve the health of subsequent generations? We know that the DNA methylation is related to uh, body mass index and respiratory outcomes. So it could be on the causal pathway. It could be uh, the mechanistic way why an exposure before someone's even conceived is leading to increased risk of disease uh, once they're born. And suggests that the associations between those preconceptual exposures and offspring outcomes may be mediated by uh, epigenetic effects. So we would uh, suggest that there are epigenetic mechanisms for cross-generational transmission of environmental memory, if you like. Uh, the challenges that we have is replicating these observations. So we've gone to look at lots of other cohorts, birth cohorts that have data. Um, many of them don't have any information on fathers because people didn't think fathers are important. They asked lots of things about the mothers and what the mother's age during pregnancy and whether they smoked and everything else. But they often don't have any information on fathers. If they do have information on fathers, they don't have uh, longitudinal information on the fathers. So they don't know when, for example, the father started smoking. They just know if they were smoking uh, while the mother was pregnant. Uh, and we would argue it's this sensitive window in adolescence and that we really need to know about the onset of the environmental exposure to be able to tease these effects apart. And so we're left working with uh, longitudinal cohorts. Many birth cohorts now are recruiting the children of the children of their cohort. We're doing the same. So our birth cohort individuals are now 35, 36, and we have about 700 children of our children. So people in our birth cohort have had children of their own. And we can begin to put these multi-generational cohorts together to look at these effects, but it takes a long time. Uh, because going through multiple generations in humans, uh, you know, takes decades, not uh, months. Um, people are beginning to say, well, can we look in the gametes and can we see a signature in the gametes of the exposure that's perhaps transmitting this signature? And it's not DNA methylation. So looking at DNA methylation in the sperm is uh, not a particularly fruitful thing to look at because we know our understanding of biology is that DNA methylation profiles are white twice through the formation of gametes and again shortly after fertilization. Uh, so it has to be something else that's uh, carrying the information uh, through uh, generations or through meiosis. And uh, work in uh, animal models uh, uh, such as in uh, rodents and Drosophila and zebrafish, would suggest that one possible route are uh, small non coding RNAs in the gametes, uh, where you can show differences in non coding RNA profiles in gametes based on environmental exposure. And then you can recapitulate the effects of the parental exposure on the offspring by micro injecting those non coding RNAs into fertilized zygotes. So suggesting perhaps non-coding RNAs that are conveying that information uh, through meiosis. So we need to work more closely with our colleagues that have these experimental models to try and understand the biological mechanisms behind these epidemiological observations. Because of course, we can't do these types of studies in humans. Uh, we have collected some uh, samples of gametes from individuals in our cohort who've kindly donated them, and we can try and look at non-coding RNAs in relation to exposures. But of course, doing definitive studies to uh, to prove that this is causal or not is um, impossible to do in humans. So I said, we don't really have experimental validation of this yet, uh, but in the last three weeks, a paper was published in Cell. I'm still working my way through. It's one of those typical Cell papers that goes on for about 20 pages and each figure has about 16 components to it, and you need to sort of work your way through it. Uh, but in this paper, um, this group used a really elegant experimental system. Uh, what they did was they insert into a CPG island a piece of uh, DNA that has no CPGs in it, uh, and it's flanked by uh, translocation elements, so they can then uh, use. Uh, a CRISPR system to take that element back out. 
So you put the DNA in, create an insertional mutation in the CPG island, you take it back out again, and it changes the DNA methylation profile of that CPG island. And that methylation profile then in these um, pluripotent stem cells persists through cell division. So effectively, they haven't created a mutation so that they've taken the mutation back out again, but they've changed the epigenetics of that island. Uh, and they did this in two different genes, and they were changing the methylation of a CPG island that they knew controlled the expression of a gene, that if you change the expression of the gene, you saw a difference of phenotype in the offspring, uh, you saw uh, increased obesity. And so they could take those germ cells, they could create chimeras from them, and then they could breed the chimeras down to subsequent generations. And they showed that that change in methylation persisted through several generations, as did the phenotype. So the environmental exposure in this case that was the change the uh, epigenetics was that insertional mutagenesis, but the environmental exposure had stopped. They'd taken that mutation back out, but the epigenetic change persisted through multiple generations. Uh, and this is the editorial that was published alongside the paper. Uh, and you can see you insert the mutation, you take the mutation back out, you change the epigenetic profile of that uh, uh, CPG island and the promoter of uh, these two genes, you get this metabolic phenotype in the chimeras that persists through into subsequent generations as well. So again, it's not the DNA methylation that's carrying the information because we know the DNA methylation uh, is white uh, through, uh, through uh, formation of gametes and again, uh, post-conception, and they showed that too, but somehow it's being reestablished in the offspring and giving you that phenotype. Uh, so it's a really elegant experimental uh, validation that this can occur between uh, generations. Uh, so what have we done? Uh, so I'm collaborating with uh, uh, Suzanne cross Atchman in uh, the Borstal Lung Research Institute. Uh, and uh, she's developing experimental models where we can try and test some of these exposures that we think are relevant to humans. Uh, here we've got a male uh, mice exposed to cigarette smoke from the onset of uh, puberty or what you'd call puberty in mice, which is a very, very short window, um, for six weeks and then mated with unexposed females. Uh, we can look at the non-coding RNAs in the sperm of the ex cigarette smoke exposed fathers and we can see differences in the non-coding RNAs. Uh, and the offspring from these fathers uh, had different growth trajectories, so changes in body weight trajectory. Uh, and uh, the work that she's doing now is to put an asthma model on top of that to see whether we can see differences in allergic airways responses in these offspring based on whether the father was exposed to cigarette smoke uh, before conception or not. So why is this all important? So sometimes I give this talk, particularly to respiratory people, and they say, well, it's really interesting that cigarette smoke is bad for you if you're a teenager, but teenagers don't smoke anymore. You know, we've got all this public health legislation, you know, we've increased the age that people can buy tobacco smoke. Uh, fewer and fewer people are smoking. You know, it's a problem solved. Well, I'd argue that cigarette smoke is only one exposure. I think the general principle that environment before conception can have effects in subsequent generations is an important one. Uh, but we also know that cigarette smoke or tobacco smoke is not the only exposure. I said that many of the cohorts I've worked with are from Northern Europe, uh, from uh, Norway and Sweden, where they use uh, uh, something called snus, which is a moist tobacco, we, uh, sort of absorb the nicotine rather than smoke it. Um, we know that nicotine in animal models is showing effects on respiratory outcomes in subsequent generations. And of course, we're seeing a change in behavior in the youth of today uh, that uh, e-cigarettes or vaping are now the most common tobacco products used uh, amongst young people uh, in the US. Um, in the UK, uh, uh, two years ago, 18%, so one in five 15 year olds uh, reported using uh, e cigarettes. So, yes, tobacco, what we're looking at in our cohorts is a memory of tobacco smoke from the generations who grew up in the 1950s and 60s and 70s when tobacco smoking was at much higher levels. We're replacing that with other exposures now uh, that may have. Uh, consequences for subsequent generations. And we would argue that we can't afford to wait to find out whether they have uh, consequences for subsequent generations. We have enough evidence to suggest that maybe there are common mechanisms here and we should be really worried about 
uh, the proliferation of uh, other uh, nicotine delivery devices uh, amongst the youth of today. Uh, so this is, uh, again, uh, sorry, um, uh, data showing, uh, US data showing uh, reduction in tobacco smoking, and this is the increase in uh, nicotine exposure through e-cigarettes, these flavoured uh, nicotine salt uh, e-cigarettes that have much higher levels of nicotine than in a, than in a uh, cigarette, and that have all these wonderful flavours. They're advertised through social media, direct to young people. Uh, and yes, legislation means that like, you really can't buy them until they're 18, uh, but we know talking to young people that they are using them, they're obtaining them, uh, they're much easier to buy and to use and to buy on the internet and to uh, use because there's no smoke. Uh, often they um, don't even smell the vapour uh, and they can use them in schools and in public places and people uh, uh, don't stop them from doing it. Uh, and so now we're going on to work uh, with colleagues uh, in our life lab facility at the uh, University of Southampton, particularly Kath Woods Townsend, who runs that uh, facility, uh, and uh, the fantastic staff she has there who have got these uh, youth engagement panels where we can uh, work with the young people in our city to really understand their behaviours, what they're exposed to, why they're exposed to it, how they get hold of it, what they think about it, and then perhaps design interventions, public health interventions, educational interventions, where we can talk to young people about the consequences of what they're exposed to, not just for them, but for the children they perhaps even haven't thought about having yet. So to try and bring this together, um, uh, epigenetics is key to the control of gene expression, cellular differentiation and growth and development. Epigenetic profiles of individuals are influenced by both their genetic background and also by their environmental exposures. Early life environmental exposures, like tobacco smoke, are associated with altered DNA methylation profiles, specific changes in DNA methylation that are then stable throughout life, and that early life methylation patterns are associated with subsequent development of disease. And finally, that epigenetic information, information maintained through meiosis may account for these intergenerational effects and transgenerational effects we see uh, in uh, asthma and allergic disease. There's still an awful lot of things we don't know, They're going to keep us busy for a long time. Um, still not absolutely clear whether DNA methylation lies on the causal pathway between genetic variation and disease. Uh, we don't really understand the interaction between genetic and epigenetic effects in determining disease development. What are the key environmental exposures and what are the key time windows where those exposures have the maximal effect on the epigenome and subsequent disease development? We don't really know whether the effects of early life environmental exposures are consistent across tissue. So every tissue will have a different epigenetic profile because uh, epigenetic is key to cellular differentiation. So if you measure um, skin and blood, you've got different tissue type. So you will have a different profile. But what we don't know in humans is whether the, the tobacco smoke signature we see in blood DNA, will we see that in uh, the skin? Will we see that in the lung? Uh, and that's mainly because most of this work has been done on DNA that people collected for genetic studies, where we didn't really mind where the DNA was coming from because your nuclear genome is almost the same everywhere. Uh, and uh, blood DNA was the easiest thing to collect from patients. If the epigenome can be modified by environment, can we change the postnatal environment to change the epigenome? And could that be a potential route to disease prevention? So if we find a signature associated with later development of the disease, can we give another environmental exposure postnatally to change the epigenetic profile? And would that reduce risk of developing disease? Again, the biological mechanisms for inter- and transgenerational effects are not clearly established, uh, and whether they explain these multi-generational effects in the elephant and that's one, we still have to uh, wait and see. Uh, so this is a review if you want to read any more of some of the work we've been doing uh, that uh, came out yesterday, I think. Um, we know the environment's important. Uh, we know the parents are important. 
It's the combination of environment exposure and genetic background that are leading to effects preconception that are having consequences for the offspring's asthma, allergic disease, and lung function. So I just want to finish by thanking all the different people that I work with. Um, so I've worked for many years with um, uh, people, particularly uh, Wilfried and Hongmei and Hassan Arshad in the Isle of Wight birth cohort. So this is the birth cohort started by Hassan for his PhD in 1989 that we're now doing the 35-year follow-up on. And we also have got what we call our F2 cohort, our children of the children. So we've now got over 700 children of people who are in the original cohort, where we begin to look at effects across generations. Uh, this is this is uh, some of the people in the Rhinessa cohort uh, that I work with, a fantastic group of people with these uh, cohorts uh, that we're looking at these multi-generational effects. Um, they also hold fantastic meetings uh, on the fjords with beautiful views. So, yeah. It's always have to come to a nice place uh, for, for meetings. And so um, I had coffee in the square yesterday looking out over the sea. So I think Trieste is an another uh, tick, a good place to have a meeting. And I particularly want to thank Nagusi in Southampton and Torrell and Bergen that have done that father smoking and offspring epigenetic profiling work that I talked about. And finally, the people in Life Lab that we're working with uh, to uh, begin to do this uh, youth engagement work around uh, uh, boys' uh, exposure to e cigarettes um, and the con potential consequences uh, to their future children. So I'll finish there, and I'm really happy to answer any questions that you have. <laughs>